a Thursday. So we're going to uh, have a guest speaker today. Uh, the other class on Monday had uh, Danielle Centeno from the American Club, and she spoke mostly about insurance, the uh, p &I club she represents, and she insures uh, a lot of the vessels, and she talked a lot about that. And I'll send you the PowerPoint that she left. Uh, today's presenter is a uh, student that was on my cruise when I was captain, uh, Matt Van Bento, and now he is uh, he's, he's a captain. Well, he'll be a captain chief right now. He's a graduate, and he sailed out, and he's actually a professor over at Kings Point right now. Don't fool me yet. Don't fool me yet. Okay. I'm going to throw him under the bus because he's working for the enemy. No, let me get uh, The fact is, uh, Matt is a, is a great uh, teacher. I'm uh, very lucky to have him. Uh, hopefully, we'll have him here as an adjunct in the future. But uh, what I'd like to do is, he also, where I met Matt uh, after graduation, is he worked with the Vanuatu flag state, that registry. So he was really big into classification society and all that flags. And he is an expert on that, in my opinion. So I'm very happy to have him here to speak to you in that regard. So uh, he can tell you a little bit about, more about himself. I'm sure I left out a ton of things. Uh, again, as a new father to be in two days. So I'm glad to have him here. We wanted to get him here before the baby was born. So I'm going to have him present to you today. Please, any questions like we had yesterday? There were a ton of questions. If you got a question, please ask. So uh, without further ado, Captain Rimmer. Thank you. All right, so before we begin, Matthew Montbento, I graduated here in 2001 on uh, Captain Walter said he was master of the training ship when I was here. So that goes to show how old I am and how old he is. <laughs> I finished my master's degree here in 2004. I sailed while going to, sailed while going to school. And I sailed for about 10 years before I took a job as Captain Lawson said, the Vanuatu Ship Registry, doing regulatory compliance, accident investigations, uh, ISO compliance, safety compliance, all sorts of fun paperwork, really is what it amounts to. Now I teach at King's Point. Not nearly as exciting as doing that, but it pays the bills. Before we begin, I'd like to see a show of hands. Who knows what a flag state is? Let's just raise a hand. What's a flag state? Where you can like register something, like register a vessel. Okay, so it gives you those like requirements and regulations that the ship has to follow. Exactly. So a flag state is like the DMV of the ocean. I buy a ship. Traditionally, if I bought a vessel, I would register it in the country in which I'm domiciled or in which my office is located. Nowadays, due to tax structure and crewing costs and other regulatory issues, you can actually register a vessel almost anywhere in the world. So if I'm an American owner and my ships never come back to American soil and all they do is sail internationally, there's no cost benefit for me to register in the United States. I would register in a country like Vanuatu or the top three, Panama, Liberia, Marshall Islands. Now, some of the myths that go on about this, back in the day when the flag states first began, they were known as flags of convenience. Why? Anybody want to take a guess? Uh, there were no rules? Yeah, they, they, there were no real rules. No one enforced the rules. And if you take, uh, if you read the business of shipping textbook, they sort of allude that that's the case nowadays. It's not. If you look at any code or convention, and we're going to talk about a few of them, in the first five paragraphs, they always say, whether or not the country is signatory to this code or convention, it shall be enforced. So there's no escaping the rules. You know, it's kind of like going outside the gate and speeding down Pennyfield Avenue. You can do it. Sooner or later, you're going to get caught. And you can say, but my car is not registered in New York. Why does it matter? The cops are still going to pull you over and give you a ticket. Same type of idea. So when we talk about regulatory compliance and the international regulatory regime, there's a lot of factors that actually come into effect. Most important thing is why do we go to sea? Does anybody know why we go to sea while we have ships? Transporting. No, 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 it's not about transporting goods. It's about making money. We're doing this to make money. You're here someday to make money. I teach not because I like it, 
because it pays my bills, right? I wouldn't do it if they weren't paying me. So everything we do is based upon the simple fact that it's done for money, All right? So we have a ship. That's not right. So let's try this one. Here's our ship. I'm not going to draw because my drawing is worse than my handwriting. Here's a ship. Everything is based upon the fact that we want this ship to get from A to B with either raw materials, processed goods, or passengers. Those are the three major products that we carry on board ships. If it makes it from A to B safely and on schedule, we've made money. Have you guys taken charter parties and learned about demerage yet? Okay, so we don't need to go into that. I want this ship to make money, but if I'm making money, picture the government is the same as the mafia, right? If I'm getting money, they want a little piece of the action. That's where we have the flag, okay? Sure, the flag state gives us all of our documentation, our document of registry, uh, sometimes a document of seaworthiness. They're tasked actually with issuing all your international convention certificates. So your MARPOL, your SOLAS, stuff like that. They issue all the certificates based upon these conventions. Sometimes they use classification societies, and we'll talk about that. But they do this, guess what? For a profit. They're not doing this for free. But why do they do this? Because they all decided at the IMO that this is important. So the IMO is composed of about 120 different flag states that have maritime interests, and they vote on all sorts of things. You should see the stuff they vote on. It's kind of like watching the circus, but in a suit. It's absolutely ridiculous, but they vote on a lot of different things. These are some of the big things that have come through, and there are more that we'll talk about. Do you think the IMO operates for free? So every code, every convention, comes in a book. Do you think that's an open format online? Or what do you think you do? You gotta pay for it. So the IMO is getting their little piece of the pot. We still have the ship. Still making money. Now, the ship, as we know, has a crew. Operating expenses. In between the ship and the flag <coughs> are the owner. Their piece of the pie, usually pretty small. So if they're not paying here, they're paying money out of here to keep this one. Why is it so expensive for that? Because we're going to talk about these conventions. Safety of life at sea. Where did Solus first come about? What was the first activity that generated Solus? You guys should all know this. The Titanic, the RMS Titanic, went down in April. That's all right, I'll edit that out later. <laughs> went down in April of 1912, the Titanic. Anybody, anybody know the story behind the Titanic's rescue efforts? Anybody know the fact that there were vessels in the area? And the Titanic was shooting off flares. But at the time, there was no codified distress signal. So let me see a show of hands in this room. Who's that? Who's going to be that? All right. You guys have taken rules of the road yet? Yes, no, some of you. So rule 38, right? 
or 36 or 38, has that whole page of pictures of distress signals in the back of the book, right? We didn't have that in 1912. So when the Titanic was shooting off flares and other vessels saw it in the area, they just thought there was a party going on. Their radio operator was already asleep. No one knew the Titanic was actually in distress and sinking. So that's where Solus comes in. Solus now says, oh, we have a code of life-saving appliances, firefighting, maritime communications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Solus tells us how everything on board has to operate. It actually sets standards. Anybody actually ever crack open Solus? All right, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, three pages in, you'll be out like a light. Trust me. I used to do it at work all the time when I needed a nap. <laughs> so it is the most boring convention. They're all boring to read, but Solus even more so. What Solus lays out is, for example, if I am a tanker of over 10,000 tons, after a certain date, I needed to have AIS installed. And that's how it operates. Solus operates on the gross tonnage of the vessel, the date of keel laying, uh, the date of implementation. So what do you think all that equals out to for the ship owner? <clears throat> Money, right? Solus comes with compliance. Compliance comes at a cost. Marpol. You guys studied Marpol yet? You know, what's Marpol? Oh, clean, right? It's maritime pollution. Do you know how many annexes there were in Marpole? There's six, okay? Marpole deals with oil. Liquid cargo. Hazardous substances. Sewage, garbage, and air pollution. Each one of these, number one, is a different certificate for the owner. Those certificates come free? No. But what's more involved, and this is something that Danielle Centeno may have touched on, is the fact that this is all surveyable material. So a surveyor will work for the flag state of the classification society, or for the owner, or for the charterer, or for various agencies such as BIMCO, SIRE, Wright Ship. They come and survey the vessel to make sure it meets these, meets these requirements. You guys know why the TSES doesn't go to foreign ports anymore? We don't need a Marpol. Well, yeah, it was 20 years ago when I was sailing on a tip. But Marpol, it doesn't meet the new Marpol standards. Specifically, the Marpol standards dealing with air pollution. So the TSES burns bunker C. There's no way you can reduce the sulfur limits coming out of the stack, even if you add seven scrubbers. It's not going to happen. It just burns too much sulfur. So we don't meet the air pollution requirements. That's Marpol. That all comes from Marpol. We all know this one, right? Everybody here is in uniform. STCW, this is the reason why you sit through classes in rules of the road, or basic engineering, thermodynamics. This is why we study how pumps operate, how to do nav celestial navigation, terrestrial navigation. It's all STCW. Before STCW, do you know how people got their licenses? It's actually pretty easy. You spend enough time at sea, someone vouches for you, you pay a couple of bucks, now you're a captain. <laughs> yeah, I know, but that's also why there were a lot of, you know, groundings, ship losses, deaths at sea, pandemonium, right? You know, there was no real credentialing. 
That was one of the original purposes of ABS, was credentialing. SDCW changes all the time. When I graduated, SDCW had only started. We didn't even have any SDCW courses in the curriculum. So I had to spend two months after graduation taking all the courses. Now, to all incorporated. But SDCW is one of the major pillars of maritime legislation. These all fall under the IMO. Up until the last few years, these were the conventions which ran the maritime industry. Everything else would fall under them somewhere. So if you had soulish issues, you had the Life Saving Appliance Code. You had the Firefighting Safety Code. You had the International Tonnage Convention. The Load Line Convention. All fell under this. Past few years, we've seen a change in the maritime industry. Real change in business, partly due to the U.S. influence. What is the one law in the U.S. that protects you when you're at sea? The Jones Act, not the Whistleblower Act. That's only if you're narking on the owner. Okay. Hey, listen, you know they do what they have to do. But thank you. The Jones Act. What does the Jones Act say? How does it protect us as mariners? What are some of the rights we have under the Jones Act? Anybody know? Nobody. Take a guess. Like, if it's an American ship going, or a ship going from one American port to another, has to have like a certain percentage of American crew. Yep. Well, that protects our jobs. I'm talking about protecting us as seafarers. Yeah. If you get injured at sea, you get a compensation. Exactly. If you're injured at sea, maintenance and cure, meaning the vessel owner has to. Rehabilitate your body as close to the original condition before your injury, and they have to pay you a stipend as, as under a certain set of rules. We were entitled to that. The United Kingdom flag vessels were entitled to that. The rest of the world was not. So if you were on a Liberian flag ship, didn't matter if you were American, if you got hurt. Oh, God. If you were on a Vanuatu flag ship, fell down two decks, busted your legs, sorry, Joe, don't have to do anything for you. What are some of the other protections that the Jones Act provides us with? Repatriation. This owner has to get you back home to your original, at least to the original point of embarkation. And if that's not in the U.S., they have to get you back to the point where you met the ship at the Union Hall, at the very least. They didn't have that overseas. If a vessel went belly up, if the owner went belly up and couldn't pay their bills, you were stranded. So traditionally, that fell on organizations like the Seaman's Church Institute to repatriate seafarers. Now, in comes the I-L-O. Who are they? The International Labor Organization. The International Labor Organization, that's right. All right, so the ILO comes along and creates a convention of their own. Now they've done maritime work before, but it was mostly insignificant dealing with vessel construction issues. This is what they call the fourth pillar of maritime legislation. They also called it the Seafarer's Bill of Rights. This is called the Maritime Labor Convention, the MLC. Guys, take notes, four fellows. Okay. This is the cornerstone of every other mar mariner's safety. This says, if you are on a ship, and the owner goes bankrupt, they have to have insurance to pay your way home. If you were on a ship and the owner goes bankrupt, they still have to pay you your wages up to the end of your contract. If you were on a ship and get injured, guess what? 
the owner now has to pay for your medical care. Beforehand, none of this happened for <coughs> foreign seafarers. That's from uh, the going the wages on some of these foreign vessels are only two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars a month for an ordinary seaman. Maybe a little more for an AD. The cost of living in these in many countries are a lot less, which is why the owners take crew from these countries as opposed to, let's say, the US, the UK, uh, other nations that have a higher cost of living. But they would also take advantage of that fact by not providing medical care, repatriation, other things like that. So the MLC comes along and says, vessel owner, you now have to have insurance to repatriate mariners. You now have to have insurance to pay them. No longer can you abandon your mariners in port, dissolve the company, and disappear. Now, all of these conventions put responsibilities on the owner and on the vessel and on the crew to follow them, right? The crew has to be STCW credential. The crew has to follow MARPOL. The crew has to follow SOLIS, Life Saving Appliance Convention, Firefighting Safety, Tonnage, Load Line. We have to follow it, but who's checking? First, we go back to the flag. The flag is responsible for ensuring that all of these conventions are being followed. Now, one of the ways that we do that is through something called the International Safety Management System. Drawing a line right here. If these are our four pillars, at the bottom is the ISM. I think it just it cut off for like 20 minutes. I just restarted. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? ISM. Right there. What's the floor? Now, ISM, the whole thing about ISM is ISM does not list what Marple says or what Solis says or what SDCW or NLC says. It's how you are going to implement it. ISM is concerned about safety of navigation, safety of the vessel, safety of the crew, protection of the environment, right? We've studied that. But it doesn't say how you're going to do it. That's the point behind ISM. It says you have to do these things. How you going about following them is up to you, right? So I may decide as a vessel owner that I require my crew to update their ECTA system every other day. That may not be practical, may not be cost effective, but that's how I'm saying I'm ensuring part of my safety of navigation. So I put that in my ISM manual. The flag or their designated person will review this. Who do they designate? Usually, it's class. So class will send a surveyor to review the ISM manual. The ISM manual then talks about how each one of these pillars, <coughs> and then some, is going to be enforced and carried out on board. But every convention, every code, as we said before, puts the responsibilities directly on the flag state. So that even if you're not a signatory flag state, you still have to ensure all this is being done. Because if, let's say, and the US has not signed Mar the Maritime Labor Convention, one convention we have not signed, I'm a US vessel, I sail into a foreign port that is signatory to the Maritime Labor Convention. I have laws in the US, the Jones Act, that are equivalent. If I have that in my ISM, I sail away free and clear. But if I don't have how these things are covered, 
then we have a problem. That problem called port state control. So if I look at the flag state as big brother, port state control is more like the angry little sibling. Right? Their job is to go on board and make sure you're following all of this. They don't necessarily look at your ISM. They just make sure that you have a certificate saying you're following it. But this is where it gets tricky. Port State Control issues a report card. It's called a Port State Control Report. This Port State Control Report has a point system on it. So let's say under Solus, my firefighting equipment is not maintained. They may say, ah, it's not maintained, just one point. But what if there's a systemic problem on board? It could just be crew laziness, but they'll turn around and say, oh no, there's a problem with your ISM. That's five points. And this game is like golf. You want to walk away with the least amount of points. More points are not good for you. So as a ship accumulates points on their port state control report, eventually the port state control officer has the right to look at the vessel and say, this is not safe for safe. You're now detained. Now, does anybody know what the difference between a detention and an arrest is? Come on. You look like you know back there. You look like you may have been one or the other. <laughs> uh, they can hold you for a bit, but they can't they can't take it away from you for the detention and the arrest. No, but, but it sounds like you've been on the back of a police car before. No. <laughs> the difference between a detention and an arrest. An arrest is when you don't pay your bills. And your creditor goes to a judge. It takes a lean out on your vessel and says, this owner, they owe me $50,000. I'm putting a lien on the vessel. When the vessel comes into port, that port state is, con is contacted, and they can, and usually do, prevent the vessel from leaving until their bills are paid. It has nothing to do with safety. It has everything to do with money. But what did we say at the beginning? Why are we here? Money, right? Now, detention is when the vessel is found to be unsafe in the eyes of the port state control officer. Now, what does that mean? We can have five different port state control officers on board the same vessel. Is everyone going to say that vessel is unsafe or safe? No. Maybe, maybe not. But Port State Control has that authority. Why? Who do they work for? The government. Government. What government? The, their country's government. Exactly. The government of the coastal states. So we as Americans follow American law on American flag vessels. When we pull our ship into another port, we are subject to the enforcement methods in that court. So here's a fun example for you. I was on a bulk carrier a number of years ago in East, in West Africa. Sun rises, Port State Control Officer comes on board. Sun just came up. They came up with a fine for about $10,000 for the captain. The captain's looking at this fine. Our flag was not up at sunrise. That was the standard in that port. Now, did we pay the fine? No. Did we give the port state control officer a couple cartons of Marlboros? And did he go away? Yes. Now, unfortunately, that's what you may deal with with certain port state control regimes. <coughs> but be that as it may, it doesn't end at port state control. So Port State Control is the coastal authority. It's kind of like joining 
a fraternity, right? You have one port state control in one country, but you have a whole bunch of them on a coastline or abutting the ocean on both sides of it, and now you have what's known as an MOU. And that's known as the Memorandum of Understanding. We have about 10 of these, the most popular being the Paris and the Tokyo MOU. So what does that mean? If I'm in the Paris MOU, obviously the French, the British, German, <clears throat> Spanish, et cetera, et cetera. All the companies in this re countries in this region share information with each other. So you leave France and you have a port state control report this long. And the items on it say resolved within 14 days. Resolve by the time you arrive in next port, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When you go to the next port, let's say you go to the UK, they already have your information on file. Like I said, it's just like the FUDs. They pull you over, they run your license plate, and a whole all your previous violations show up. Believe me, I know it happens often enough. And they know what you are supposed to do and where they're supposed to look. They come on board your vessel and verify that you've done what you're supposed to do. If you've done it, fine. Everybody walks away, it's a happy day. If you haven't, see detention. <coughs> Bless you. <coughs> so, you wanna try again? Yeah. All right. So your best is to paint. So that memorandums of understanding all share information with each other. You, know, you can't escape it, it is the information age now. And who do you think they contact? Come on. Come on. The flag state. All goes back to the flag state. Now, what did we say at the beginning the flag state is doing this for? Money, right? Now, if the ships are getting a report card under the MOU, so are the flag states and the classification societies. So if I have underperforming vessels that are constantly causing issues, it lowers my ranking on what they call the white list. This white list is a list put out by the Paris and the Tokyo MOU every year. Go on their websites, look up Paris MOU, flag state white list, or flag state ratings. And it'll show you which flag states have a percentage of detentions per vessel visit. And the ones at the top have a lower percentage of detentions per vessel visits. The ones lower on the list have a lot more detentions a lot higher ratio of detentions. Now, if I'm a charterer, do I want to charter a vessel that's in the white list or on a flag state that's on the black or the gray list? I want to charter the white list. So we go back to the whole money thing again. Flag states are here for the money. If you get detained too many times, Kind of like pruning a tree. I have to cut you loose. But it's not that easy to just get rid of the vessel. So the first thing we do is we send out class. We send out our own surveyors. Independent surveyors who work directly for the flag. We may contact your P&I club and say, hey, what's going on with this vessel? Maybe you need to check this out. Flag can actually call Port State Control and say, hey, next time this vessel goes to port, we want you to inspect them to clear up these deficiencies. Why would I do that? Why on God's green earth, if I know you're underperforming, would I call and narc on you? For one reason only. 
You've said to me, oh, my friend, my friend, I swear. It was all misunderstanding. It is all fixed now. There is no problem on board. I take you at your word. I'm going to send port state control out there after my surveyor has gone on board and verified to clear this off of our record. Because once again, if you're underperforming, that looks bad on me. Looks bad on the classification society. And what happens when we look bad? Come on. Business. We make less money. We lose business. That's why we're here. I'm not here for my good looks. I'd have to pay out if I were here for my good looks. Okay? So every one of these is here for the money. Underperforming vessels if they are not living up to the standards of MLC, SDCW, Marple, Solis, ISM, if my surveyors can't verify they're doing their job, class surveyors can't verify that, vessel has to get cut. And when that happens, it's bad for the vessel owner. But the black mark still remains with the class and the flag for a minimum of three years. Right? So has anybody ever run their, their driver's abstract to see how many tickets and violations you've had? You're smiling, you have, haven't you? Yeah, I just know that. Yeah, well, you know, I ran mine re recently because I wasn't sure if I was going to be allowed to keep my license. I had to, you know, count up the number of points to see where I was. It's pretty close, but I think I'll be all right for the time being. Same thing happens here. You, you have enough violations Class will drop you. Flag will drop you. So the Port State Control Officer's job is to ensure that all of these conventions are being carried out. They report back to the flag, who in turn, guess who they have to report to? The IMO. So if the, if the ships are getting audited, guess who else is getting audited? Flag State. So the flag state gets audited by the IMO to ensure that we're living up to our end of the bargain. The flag state will then in turn ensure that they audit the classification society to make sure that they're living up to their obligation to the flag. Class will then serve it, will then, ooh, where'd I put that? I, where's it? The class will then audit the owner who audits the ship. So you see, it's all one big chain. One leads into the other, which leads into the other, which brings the circle back around. <laughs> the only way money is actually made in all of this is everybody gets a little piece of the pie. So we're going to look at this. I don't go by this, it's not a great circle. The ship has to turn enough of a profit to not just cover operating expenses, but for future earnings and savings, to cover times in a down market, to cover new conventions that may actually cost the ship owner money. Then we know what some of the newer ones are. I'm sure you've heard about them in some of your classes. Low sulfur. Low sulfur, yep, what else? Come on, there's only two of you guys talking here. There's a whole room. Bueller. And we're here at the Ballast Water Convention. No. no? All right, so the Ballast Water Convention states you cannot carry living organisms from one part of the world to another inside your ballast tanks. And when you transfer ballast out of your ballast tanks, they can, or state control can actually now sample and test to see how much living organisms there are. So the zebra mollusk, for example, was one that was devastating local environments. Now IMO has turned around and the Coast Guard has turned around and said, 
No more of this. So you're gonna have to treat your ballast water. You have to do ballast water exchanges in mid-ocean, or you have to keep your ballast water on board so you pump it back out the port that you pumped it back in on. Does you guys ever heard of ballast water transfer? Ballast water transfer? I didn't wow. it's not implemented yet. Oh, it's been implemented for the past few years. You guys ever hear of the Golden Ray? Like in Brunswick, Georgia? Yeah. Well, that's one way around it. But you may not always have that option. Yeah. Okay? So the ship has to be able to cover all these future operating expenses. What's the average lifetime considered on a ship? 20 years is minimal. They're pushing 30. Some ships are pushing a lot more than that. But optimally, they're pushing for 20 years. So you have the ship has to make a profit. The owner, of course, has to make a profit. Class makes a profit. Flag. IMO, right? Crew. coastal state or each port that you deliver or pick up cargo in. And then you also have places like right here, SUNY Maritime, Kings Point, your union schools, the training facilities. Why are they here? What do they have to do with this? Get the crew. It's a lot of future crew. <laughs> STCW, right? So if an STCW is a requirement for every single licensed and unlicensed mariner, I can't just write a letter as flag and say, you're all right, you're a good dude, you're STCW compliant. It doesn't work like that. Yes? What about insurance? Yeah, I didn't make enough lines. Insurance. Charterer. The brokers. As you can see, all of this here, when we're planning a voyage, and in the future we're looking at how much profit is a vessel going to make when I charter it or I'm a broker, how is the vessel going to make a profit? A lot of the times, vessel owners are not looking far enough ahead at what the regulatory compliance aspect of owning the vessel is going to be. A couple of years ago, when the Maritime Labor Convention came out, it finally it was written in 2006. It didn't come into effect until 2012, right? because a lot of flag states didn't sign on to it. Once it came into effect, all of a sudden, we're, we're now looking at vessel owners trying to find the money to comply. There had been no insurance policies up until that point to cover repatriation of crew, maintenance and cure of crew if they're injured while on the job. So now vessel owners' operating expenses, in some cases, double the triple. That happens. The good vessel owners planned for this. They had already reinvested the profits the vessel made into future expenses. But the vessel owners that didn't went bankrupt. Anybody know of a local US law that did the same thing to, to the local industry? Subchapter M. Anybody know what that is? No, okay. Any, you know where, go tell us subchapter M. Tugs? Tugs and towing industry, that's right. So if you're operating in the tugs and towing industry, you now have to have your own type of ISM manual. They call it the subchapter M manual, but it's basically a compliance manual as to how you're going to comply with the new Coast Guard regulations. That took towing vessel owners by such surprise that many of them are still struggling to financially comply. Because once again, is it just the Coast Guard 
or who else is going to be involved? Oh, where are they? Class. ABS. Class NK. The NVGL. Third party authorizations are allowed to do the inspections for subchapter M. Do they do it for free? No. You have to write an ISM manual or a subchapter M manual. You call me, I'll do it for you. Do I do it for free? No. When I do a sub M manual, I charge five to seven thousand dollars depending on the owner. Right there. That's an expense. But one thing where most vessel owners fail is utilizing ISM as a tool. It can actually be cost savings. For example, if I know that I have to dispose of garbage ashore because I am not going far enough offshore to dump food garbage, well, I make arrangements ahead of time if I'm on a regular route. It's about building relationships, right? So half the business, especially in the maritime industry, is relationships. I've known Captain Alston for quite a number of years. I call him when I have a question completely unrelated to teaching, if I have something I'm curious about. And I know if he doesn't have the answer, he'll tell me where to go. ISM is the same way. If I know I'm discharging garbage every five days, I figure out where my route I'm going to be every five days. I make a long-term contract with the shoreside garbage disposal. That way, I don't have to worry about it. If I am dealing with dirty ballast and I'm going from port to port where I can't dump it, maybe I make arrangements with a local ballast processing plant. Right? They'll process it for me. But under ISM, if I don't have a good DPA, I'm off that proverbial creek without a paddle. Now, what's the DPA? Designated person ashore. Do you guys know how you get to be a designated person ashore? You know a lot of people. Yeah, that's part of it, absolutely. But how else? So, the ISM can code actually tells you the requirements to be a DPA. You have to have been a management level officer with auditing experience, or you have to have requisite training. Introducing the prospective DPA to all the appropriate codes and conventions. That's a full-time job right there. I work with a lot of DPAs at the flag state, most of them very knowledgeable people, but it takes time to keep up those resources. You have to take classes, you have to study, spend a lot of time learning the information and keeping up with the updates. And I think we were just about at that time, aren't we, Cap? You know, in the right hand corner, Matt, put yeah. down TISMIS, because I need to talk about that. <coughs> talk about the safety management system and subchapter M. And I think also we're weak on regulations, put that down. Too. I'll send you a sample tip, <coughs> TISMIS. Yeah. I actually, I used to do this with ABS. I, I chose a contract with them. I did uh, gateway towing up the north.